Nonprofits are supposed to be inherently good, helpful organizations that give back to the community. However, faith in nonprofits has been dropping. They can't keep up with for-profit salaries in the current job market. They have to turn away those that they want to help. And many nonprofits have found themselves stuck in a dangerous cycle. So why does this happen? Is the system of how nonprofits operate broken? And if so, is there a way to fix it? Hello, and welcome to The Corporate Casket. I'm the Illuminati, and today we're going to be talking about nonprofits. Initially, I wanted to discuss nonprofits that come across as performative or can only help on a superficial level. For example, maybe you've heard about nonprofits offering classes on financial literacy. Many say that these types of classes have helped them tremendously, insisting we need this sort of help to be more widespread and available. However, there are also those that say financial education is only a superficial fix. It can't fix poverty, and what we really need is structural change. In a weird way, this kind of reminds me of when McDonald's offered a finance guide to their employees in 2013. The budget McDonald's created for their employees suggested allowing $20 for healthcare, $600 for rent, and $150 for a car payment. It didn't even include gas for said car or even a food allowance, thereby coming across as extremely tone deaf. Tio Reyes, the program director for Restaurant Opportunities Center United said that this might've actually been commendable if McDonald's were trying to be a part of a movement to increase wages. Instead, this was just disingenuous and insulting. Or another example, the case of Locks of Love. Now I've mentioned and talked about them in an entirely different episode, how they give wigs to children with alopecia. However, they've turned down kids with cancer and given how much hair is actually donated to them, it feels ridiculous that they wouldn't want to help everyone that they can. Why would they act like they care so much about helping children charge so much for these wigs, but then turn kids that are in need away, right? Well, I wanted to see if other nonprofits were being accused of the same things, this same kind of superficial help. And I wanted to try and determine what makes a nonprofit performative versus genuinely helpful. However, it's not just the courses and the help they're capable of offering that can be the point of contention for nonprofits, but down to the very structure itself. Today, we're getting into the core and the cycles of starvation that many nonprofits have found themselves trapped in and how that cycle has changed in recent years. So let's get into it. First, let's begin by describing what a nonprofit is exactly. A general definition for nonprofits is organizations that are created for a public or mutual benefit other than generating profit for owners or investors. This means that nonprofits are meant to be institutions that profit the people or the community, not themselves or the people that donate to them. Unfortunately, there have been some stories of nonprofits being used to benefit the people running them or some people who work within them. For instance, Mary Guanard, who was one of the executive directors of Susan G. Komen, was accused and convicted of embezzling from the organization in 2009. But in general, most nonprofits are designed and in fact required to use the money earned from fundraising, sales, or programs to run the organization. Nonprofits can vary in size from giant national organizations to local grassroots, and the type of nonprofit or legal form of them can also vary wildly. Now there are two main different legal forms of nonprofits, including the 501c3 organizations or 501c4. The first type is often called public benefit organizations. And these nonprofits are not only exempt from taxation, but also allow for tax deductible donations from individuals or corporations. The second one is widely referred to as social welfare organizations. And these are usually advocacy organizations for social and political causes. While they are exempt from taxation, donations to a 501c4 are not tax deductible. Some organizations can hold both statuses like Planned Parenthood, for example. The NRA is a 501c4, as well as the National Organization for Women, otherwise known as NOW. Volunteer fire companies can also be considered under the 501c4 regulations. An example of a 501c3 organization is the Innocence Project, which works on behalf of wrongfully convicted and incarcerated people in the criminal justice system, or the Humane Society, which works to protect animals and stop animal cruelty. The IRS classifies nonprofits as religious, charitable, scientific, or educational organizations. The nonprofit sector has been tax exempt since 1913 when Congress approved the Revenue Act. Now gaining the 501c3 status is vital for organizations that are looking to receive grants, which many nonprofits rely on to survive. But to gain this status, organizations have to follow a few guidelines. They have to be separate from the government and are generally prohibited from direct involvement in political advocacy. 
So this is why the NRA and now are classified as 501c4s. Additionally, nonprofits have to be self-governing and any profit gained either from grants, donations, or sales of products have to be used within the organization, not for the profit of the owners or board of directors. Now, nonprofits can emerge for a variety of reasons and purposes. They can form in an attempt to address government failure in providing housing, food, or other necessities to an average person or people living in poverty, or they can be as a way to promote collective action. Nonprofits often provide services, advocate for reform, help build communities, or provide space for innovation. But since they rely on donations, foundation support, or the availability of volunteers or people willing to work for often lower pay, some nonprofits have run into issues trying to accomplish their goals. Within the last decade, activists and progressives have begun to question the effectiveness of nonprofits, especially those that rely on foundations and grants to run and fund their programs. In a book containing a variety of articles addressing issues within nonprofits, their organizational strategies and effectiveness titled, The Revolution Will Not Be Funded, they address the concept of the nonprofit industrial complex. The book defines this as a set of symbiotic relationships that link political and financial technologies of state and owning class control with surveillance over public political ideology, including and especially emergent progressive and leftist social movements. And that's a bit of a mouthful, so let's break it down a little bit more. So basically we can understand the nonprofit industrial complex as the relationship between governments, businesses, and nonprofit organizations. Nonprofits, especially smaller grassroots nonprofits, often depend on larger nonprofits to get funding. But where do those larger nonprofits get their money? Answer, foundations. The problem with this is that foundations have a lengthy history of being run by multimillionaires and have also historically been used to hide wealth since it is tax exempt. Additionally, foundations are run by those people who control industries and are often interconnected to the government. This means that nonprofit industrial complex is the idea that rich, well-connected millionaires control what nonprofits can and will do by deciding which of them is able to get funded. Christine E. Ahn, who is quoted in The Revolution Will Not Be Funded, explains that some of the issues related to nonprofits relying on foundations. And she says that foundations essentially rob the public of monies that should be owed to them and give back very little of what is taking in lost taxes. Foundations, according to Ahn, rarely use the funding to develop meaningful programs, services, or institutions that can truly benefit the poor or disenfranchised. Additionally, as nonprofits rely heavily on funding from foundations, they must also adhere to the foundation's vision or rules. The nonprofit Insight, Women of Color Against Violence Learned, who contributed to the making of the book, The Revolution Will Not Be Funded, told a story of their experience with funding in the introduction of the book. Insight began in 2000 and at first was funded through donations. But as time went on, as with the story of many other nonprofits, Insight started to use grants to support their work. Then in 2004, they received a $100,000 grant from the Ford Foundation to cover their operating expenses. Of course, at first, this was exciting, but that quickly changed. Shortly after receiving their funding, the Ford Foundation sent them a letter saying their approval for funding had been denied. And so you may ask, why? Did they find something bad about this nonprofit maybe? Were they stealing money or not providing the services that they said they would? No. Instead, their funding was denied after they released a statement of support for the Palestinian liberation struggle. Nonprofits relying on foundation grants often face these types of issues where their funding can be threatened if they create programs or release statements that go against the foundation's viewpoints. This can and will ultimately harm the people organizations are trying to help. These grants can also cause certain regulations that can harm the population. For instance, some rehab facilities may only allow people who do not have children to access their services because their grant may require this stipulation. The nonprofit industrial complex can also contribute heavily to performative actions by nonprofits. Now, this is like what we talked about with McDonald's and the financial wellness classes earlier. Performative actions are those that offer a solution to a problem without actually changing what is actually causing the issue. So in a sense, these solutions aren't really doing anything to address the issue. And instead they're more like just a Band-Aid fix on a bigger gaping wound. While some groups may be working both towards social change and to provide services, there are many more groups providing social services that are not working for social change. As described in MS Magazine, people aren't struggling with economic insecurity because they know less. They're struggling because of the systemic barriers that exclude them from more income and wealth. Additionally, multiple studies have found that these types of courses don't even help change financial behaviors. 
In a study published in the journal Management Science, which analyzed over 100 papers and 200 different studies, they found the following. Financial literacy education was responsible for a 0.1% change in financial behaviors. So if we know this, why do nonprofits, which we obviously hope have the best of intentions, still do this? Well, as I said, a lot of it can depend on who's funding them. If a foundation grant requires these types of courses, then a nonprofit may be forced to do them. Another reason could be just the general disconnect from nonprofit institutions and the people they're trying to serve. As the nonprofit sector in the United States has grown to account for more than one trillion, and that's T, trillion in spending, they have become increasingly more professionalized. Nonprofits may be required by their foundational grants to hire people that are providing certain services to have advanced degrees like masters or PhDs. This may not be entirely necessary for the service, but might be required all the same. Additionally, more and more people are getting advanced degrees in things like nonprofit management, which as Truth Out puts it, to seek to bring corporate management techniques to the world of nonprofits. While there is nothing wrong with getting advanced degrees and it is definitely something to be celebrated usually, nonprofits relying on hiring these only advanced degree folks can cause some problems. For one, it can create a massive disconnect between the people the organizations are trying to serve and the people working to serve them. Additionally, these people who the nonprofits are trying to serve are effectively locked out of being able to work with the organization itself. In a conversation with Habiba Hack, a human rights advocate and project manager with a nonprofit that focuses on inclusion in sports discussed on community-centric fundraising org, she discusses how nonprofits use programs to benefit themselves rather than the group. Hack says, at these institutions, leaders tend to favor the ones who make them feel comfortable, who aren't asking the organization and leadership to do better. Simultaneously, they also put out equity-based programs to members of radicalized or underrepresented communities to build their institution's reputation. Hack is alluding to the tendency for organizations to ignore marginalized voices within their institution and promote programs that may not be helpful purely to get the credit or their name in the public eye. Ideally, nonprofits would be focused on working with the people they are trying to offer help to, to develop programs and solutions to those problems. But unfortunately, some nonprofits don't seem to be really focused on that. And this again can be attributed to the reliance on foundational funding for programs. For example, researchers studying the anti-violence movement have found that some anti-violence organizations focus less on grassroots organizing and more on providing services. In turn, they ignored the ability of survivors of domestic abuse to organize and create programs to participate in. And they were only viewed as clients in need of service. So with nonprofits that are highly relying on professionalism and funding, the way they measure their success can also be really questionable. When you hear high performing in relation to a nonprofit organization, you would also hope that this means that they're looking to make big changes in their communities and providing services that have benefited large groups of people. But unfortunately, this is not how most nonprofits measure their performance. Instead, high performance nonprofits, according to Forbes, are usually those that maintain their status as a 501c3, have funding from multiple sources, maintain organized leadership, and can demonstrate long-term health of their organizations. This again places the focus of the success of the business of nonprofits, rather than focusing on the services or solutions. In one case, the Forbes article describes how effective leadership in nonprofits and success with engaging with stakeholders is one of the most imperative aspects of high performing nonprofits. Again, while fundraising is obviously important for a nonprofit, it would be more beneficial to have leaders that successfully engage with the community rather than just stakeholders. This can cause nonprofits to focus more on themselves instead of placing their focus on the community. David Wertimer, deputy director of the Pacific Northwest Initiative with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation told the Stanford Social Innovation Review that he left his job as a nonprofit executive director because, I realized that I was consistently putting the needs of my organization above the interests and needs of the clients we were serving. Measuring performance through dollars raised, membership, or people served are obviously important, but they don't show whether a nonprofit is achieving its mission or not, or adequately helping those the way they set out to. Part of this comes from the extremely vague missions that some nonprofits put forth for themselves. Care USA's mission is to affirm the dignity and worth of individuals and families living in some of the world's poorest communities. This isn't a mission that would be easy to measure the success of. And obviously these types of missions can make it difficult for people to determine their success and some nonprofits oversimplify in their measurement. America's Second Harvest, which has a mission to feed the hungry, measured its success by how much food it had collected and distributed. And while yes, this is obviously good that they're giving out food, but it doesn't address the issue of why people are even hungry. 
Realizing this, America's Second Harvest decided to change its mission to end hunger in the United States. This caused them to switch their strategy from feeding the hungry to programs that promote advocacy and public education. Them switching their terminology and mission from something extremely vague and frankly, quite difficult for a nonprofit organization to succeed in to a mission that would be more widespread and focused on fixing the issue altered how the organization worked and how they measured and perceived success. Since the nonprofit sector is incredibly diverse, there's no one way of measuring success that would work like as a standard across all nonprofits. But some solutions to measuring success beyond money, funding, or organizational efficiency would be to conduct research outside of their organization by talking to their community. Another way would be by measuring their impact on the community before and after their interventions. While not all nonprofits fall into these performative behaviors or measures based purely on monetary success, the critiques of the nonprofit sector have been flourishing. And additionally, the treatment of employees in the nonprofit space has widely begun to be questioned and criticized. And before we get into taking a look at how employees were treated in the nonprofit sector, let's just take a moment to thank today's sponsors. And of course, when it's cold outside, the weather is miserable, going outside doesn't seem very fun. And sometimes when you have to go get groceries, maybe you're just hungry and don't wanna cook, it's even more miserable. But thankfully, DoorDash can help you out with that. It doesn't matter if you just want takeout from your favorite place, or maybe you forgot an item at the grocery store you really, really need, or just want some late night cookies or snacks, DoorDash can grab that for you. Or if you're like me, and you just got your HelloFresh box like I just did the other day, and you notice that they have a little bit of garlic in one of your items, but you are a garlic girl, if you feel me. And uh, my goofy ass while I was at the grocery store forgot to go get garlic. So I had to DoorDash garlic. DoorDash can help you out if you forget an important ingredient like garlic. And ordering is super easy and everything is left safely outside your door when you choose contactless delivery drop off. So for a limited time, our listeners can get 25% off and zero delivery fees on their first order of $15 or more when you download the DoorDash app and enter code casket. That's 25% off up to a $10 value and zero delivery fees on your first order when you download the DoorDash app in the app store and enter code casket. Don't forget that's code casket for 25% off your first order with DoorDash. Subject to change, terms apply. Today's episode is also sponsored by Honey, the easy way to save when shopping on your iPhone or computer. I love being able to shop online while in my PJs, but I'm terrible at keeping track of promo codes and who has time for that? But now I have Honey to help find those precious money saving codes for me. Honey is the free shopping tool that searches the internet for promo codes and applies the best ones to your cart. Now, recently I've been reducing how much I've been buying online. I've been really trying to hold back, but I've used Honey to help purchase furniture for the house when I needed a new rug from a furniture store. It's even helped me buy some supplies for the candle making business and of course clothing. So they're literally everywhere. And now Honey just doesn't work on your desktop alone. It also works on your iPhone. Just activate it on Safari on your phone and save on the go. If you don't already have Honey, you could be straight up missing out on amazing savings. And by getting it, you'll be doing yourself a solid and supporting the show. And I'd never recommend something I don't use. And I've been using Honey for years. So get Honey for free at joinhoney.com slash casket. That's joinhoney.com slash casket. Now that we've discussed the foundation and structure of nonprofits, as well as what can go wrong in that department, let's get into how employees are treated. And again, let me stress that this is not how all nonprofits operate, but it's become enough of a pattern to be a problem. One Washington Post article written by Carla Miller, a daycare teacher for a nonprofit that serves limited income families, illustrated this problem with one massive example, floating paychecks. When nonprofits depend on external funding and charitable giving, there can be lean seasons or times of the year where people just aren't donating as much. As a result, paychecks don't always arrive. Well, the check itself might come in, but there just isn't enough money in the bank to cash it. Carla claims that those who delay getting to the bank may have to wait up to an additional week to receive their pay at her nonprofit. She also believes that they exploit some workers who come from outside the United States and don't know that this kind of behavior, floating paychecks, is not really acceptable. But Carla isn't alone. In a 2013 report from the Urban Institute that surveyed over 4,000 nonprofits, many of them struggled with delays in payment, difficult securing funding for the full cost of services and other financial issues. Of course, it's not just the checks that are not arriving on time, but the amount that's written on them is an issue too. As The Atlantic explains, funders may have unrealistic expectations about how much it costs to run a nonprofit. 
After all, they want to see their money helping those in need, which is commendable, but the cost of employees, services, equipment, and things of that nature are important to consider. Still, in order to secure said funding, nonprofits might try to spend less on overhead, AKA salaries, and underreport expenses. This response only affirms these unrealistic expectations, creating the nonprofit starvation cycle. Unfortunately, when this cycle begins and salaries are cut, it's the employees who really suffer. Many of them are depended on to work unpaid overtime. In 2016, since no major updates to overtime rules were made since the 1970s, only a meager 7% of workers were even qualified for mandatory overtime pay. However, once updates were finally issued a few years ago, the salary threshold for guaranteed overtime pay doubled from 23,000 to 47,476. While this may be a win for workers, this made things all more difficult for nonprofits. U.S. Public Interest Group, PIRG, said that this was especially unrealistic for nonprofit cause-oriented organizations, forcing them to hire fewer staff and limit their hours. Still, this update was an important move to ensure overtime to those that need it and try to keep people from burnout. Back in 2011, about half of the 2000 nonprofit employees interviewed by Opportunity Knox were either burned out or in danger of it. Their partner, Jessica Word, an associate professor of public administration at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, told The Atlantic that these are highly emotional emotional and difficult jobs. These organizations often have very high rates of employee turnover, which results from a combination of burnout and low compensation. Just how low is that compensation though? Well, a 2014 study by Third Section New England found that almost half of nonprofit employees in New England, 43%, were making less than $28,000 a year, well below the national median income. One woman interviewed for the article, L. Roberts, said that she worked over 40 hours per week at a domestic violence shelter in Northwest Indiana. L. claims that the culture at the shelter was, you do whatever it takes to get whatever it is done for the people that you are serving. Anything less than that, and you're not quite enough. This attitude may benefit the image of the nonprofit as one that will go above and beyond for those in need, but it genuinely seemed to hurt the workers who can't even help themselves. According to L., she once responded to a call from a woman who needed help escaping. The woman asked her to listen to a recording of the sounds of fighting and the woman screaming and crying. On days like that, Elle said she knew she wanted to get herself therapy, but she couldn't actually afford it because she only made enough to pay for basic needs. So how can nonprofits pay more? Is there any way for them to do so? John Annis, Senior VP of Collaboration and Impact at the Charles and Marjorie Baransik Foundation and Ascend Fellow of the Aspen Institute told Nonprofit Pro that he's met hundreds of loyal, talented, and passionate people in the many years he's been involved. And the thing that they all have in common is they're underpaid. According to John, this is a systemic issue from within and the easy way to fix it is ditching the shoestring mentality. And shoestring essentially meaning a small amount of money simply can't cover its full intended purpose. Time for the habit of going from putting out one fire to another while begging for emergency funding to ride off into the sunset, the article writes. The Humane Society of Manatee County in Florida has already started to attempt this approach, offering compensation packages that are reasonably competitive with for-profit business. As for why other nonprofits haven't taken this approach, well, often it's easier said than done to take part in such a massive overhaul. Nonprofits are expected to perform like businesses, tighten budgets and cutting costs without having any of the bargaining power and ability to raise costs that businesses have. There's also the stereotypes to consider. The Stanford Social Innovation Review wrote that as many workers opt to make less and go into a nonprofit field, they're often considered less educated or even stupid for doing so. Despite nonprofits relying more on people having advanced degrees, assumptions that these workers aren't smart or industrious enough to pursue lucrative jobs persist, even if they aren't true. Eliminating harmful assumptions and changing how we view nonprofits obviously won't happen in a day. And unfortunately, employees have only faced more challenges in recent years. In 2017, the staff for Rocky Mountains Colorado Planned Parenthood won the election to unionize. However, the Planned Parenthood leadership quickly turned to the Republican controlled National Labor Relations Board to challenge the outcome. Many that supported the union were disappointed and upset that Planned Parenthood of all organizations would look to the Trump administration to help. Lisa Featherstone wrote an article for The Guardian at the time accusing the Colorado chapter of pitting two powerful beacons of progressive politics against one another. And for Planned Parenthood to fight it, it just kind of put a bad taste in people's mouths to say the very least. Some articles argued that this decision would have a chilling effect reporting that while PPRM won the vote, Trump's labor board attempted to appeal the decision to allow micro units to organize. In other words, employers could potentially force unions to organize larger numbers across state lines, such as making the PPRM union also include their Las Vegas facilities over 700 miles away. 
Inside Charity reported in 2021 that many grievances voiced by nonprofit employees seeking to join a union suggest employees can no longer deal with the tension of working to change their clients' lives and circumstances while putting up with the same stuff in their nonprofit. Unionizing would allow these employees a chance to be heard, a chance that they clearly need. Yet, despite this movement to unionize nonprofits having started in 1995, many still seem hesitant, but why? The argument used against unionizing is a tale as old as time. Well, for a nonprofit at least, because it gives them less control. Even nonprofits known for civil rights advocacy have been particularly contentious to unions. The National Center for Transgender Equality, for example, fired all the employees in the union's bargaining unit for retaliation for their organizing work. Their executive director, Maria Kielsing, said that the NCTE supports the rights of employees to organize, saying the allegations against them are false. Nonprofits have, for many, become essential. They had to open up during the pandemic, even without proper protective gear. They've replaced government social programs despite being unable to fully meet those needs, and many relied on overtime from their employees. Needless to say, unionizing is important for workers' rights, and there's no doubt in that, but it's admittedly difficult to imagine them being able to suddenly meet a union's demand when for a while, many people have been underpaid and overworked. And in the wake of the pandemic, things are only getting worse. The New York Times reported in late 2021 that many for-profit businesses have been able to overcome staffing difficulties during the nationwide labor shortage because they can offer higher wages. Nonprofits, on the other hand, can't. Carrie Miranda, executive director of Looking Upwards, a nonprofit in Rhode Island that works with adults and kids that have intellectual and developmental disabilities, spoke with the New York Times and she said, "'We've lost our ability to become competitive. When a new person comes to the door, I can't say yes to them and they desperately need the services. We used to compete with hospitals and other healthcare entities for wages, and now we're competing with the convenience stores, the fast food places, the coffee shops. I've heard more and more people say, I'd love to stay in this job. I'm passionate about the work, but I need to feed my family. I have to pay my rent. Emotionally and physically draining work at Looking Upwards does serve the community, but pay starts at $15.75 an hour, whereas the Wendy's down the street offers $17 an hour. Some employees like Steffi Molina says she would have stayed at her nonprofit job if they would have just given her a $2 an hour raise to $18 an hour so she could actually make a living wage. Instead, when her employer wasn't able to do so, she got a job at a for-profit healthcare tech company where she earned $75,000 a year. Molina says she misses the nonprofit where she works since she liked directly helping families even if she does enjoy her current one. It's just a shame that a nonprofit lost a fantastic talent like Molina over $2 an hour. And of course, in the midst of a crisis like the pandemic, demand for nonprofits has skyrocketed. Child welfare, mental health, and other direct services are needed more than ever, but the employees just aren't compensated fairly. Beth Bixie, CEO of Tides Family Services, another Rhode Island nonprofit, said that one veteran employee working in a program for at-risk children was earning the same amount as her 17-year-old daughter, who's employed at a cosmetics retailer. Bixie called it demoralizing. And demoralizing is right. Even those not involved with the nonprofit sector have seen these trends and frankly, started to lose faith in the industry altogether. Given everything we've talked about today, it's no wonder that faith in nonprofits is dropping. And again, just to hammer the point home, I don't believe that all nonprofits operate this way or even that they all have bad intentions. Just like for-profit businesses, there's a wide range of them as well as a wide range of issues and benefits. Hopefully this sheds just a bit of light on why these things even happen in the first place. But with all of that being said, that's where I'm going to end today's episode of The Corporate Casket. I hope you enjoyed it and I hope you learned something new. And if you did, make sure you're liking, following, and subscribing to stay up to date on all the latest episodes. And a special thank you to all of our patrons who help us create all these amazing episodes. Can't do it without you. And you guys make a very lovely Discord server as well. So thank you so much for being around and hanging out and chatting and sharing many, many pictures of your pets. I love to see them all. But with all of that being said, that is of course my opinion. These are my thoughts and that's where I'm gonna end today's episode. So thank you for spending some of your time here with me today. I really appreciate it. And I'll see you in the next one. Bye.